Hi, welcome to Geek Toolkit. I'm Joe Farrow, and welcome to my first episode. This episode is about my favorite geek tool, 3D printers. In this episode, I want to talk about things I wish I'd known before I got into 3D printing a couple of years ago. Let's get to it. The first thing I want to talk about is time. Now there's two types of time I want to talk about. There's machine time, which is how long a 3D print takes on the machine, and then there's the actual time it takes to complete a 3D print. The reason I want to talk about this is when I first was going to get into 3D printing, I imagined these fantasies of printing like five Raspberry Pi cases in an hour. The reality is my first 3D print was a Raspberry Pi Nintendo case. The machine time to print this is seven hours, but because of the size of my print bed, I had to print it in two separate prints. Each of those prints was a three hour print. Now this is kind of how time unfolded for me. I set up my first print, prepared my bed, and told it to print. Then I went to sleep for the night because it was a three hour print and I wasn't going to sit there watching it. When I woke up in the morning, I removed the print and cleaned up supports and started my second print and went to work. At the end of the workday, I had my Raspberry Pi case. Now this total time was over 16 hours between the sleeping and being at work. So even though the Raspberry Pi case only took about seven hours of machine time, the actual time it took to print was quite a bit longer. Another thing I didn't realize that related to time is that printing 3D objects is not 100%. This means that if I go to print a Raspberry Pi case and I'm at the wrong resolution and it takes seven hours, I could blow the entire print and have to do it again. Or sometimes something goes wrong in the environment or the heat or temperature changes and this can also ruin your 3D prints. Since 3D printing is not 100%, you do get more efficient as you get better at it, but at the start you've got to add additional time for anything you do. Finally, at the end of the 3D print, there's post-processing and finishing. This includes everything from sanding, removing supports, and painting the 3D print. This can take as long as the 3D print as well. So these are all things that you should think about when you get into this hobby and when you understand the time it takes to print something. The number two thing I want to talk about is the size of the bed of a printer. When I was looking at the size of printers, I was imagining that this would be about the size of the thing I wanted to print. For instance, a really big printer might print a full cosplay helmet and a smaller printer might be good for like little miniatures. The reality is we had just talked about the time it takes to 3D print something and I talked about that Raspberry Pi case. With a printer that had a bigger bed, I would have been able to print both of my parts on the bed at the same time. So the size of the bed can equate to efficiency. Had I had the larger bed, instead of taking the 16 to 24 hours it took to do that initial print, I could have printed the pieces side by side and had seven hours of machine time equate to about eight or nine hours of my actual time based on me sleeping through the night, waking up and having the full completed project ready to go. So bed size can create more efficiency, but of course it also does allow you to print larger things. Now I'm going to take that back and go the opposite way. If you have a smaller 3D printer, you'll find a lot of the bigger models out there have been sliced to work on a smaller 3D printer. What ends up happening is say you print a helmet, instead of printing one large helmet, it'll print in eight separate pieces. What you end up doing next is gluing those pieces together and then sanding and bonding them. So there's a bit of finish work. Again, smaller printer, more time, but the flexibility is still there to print some amazing cosplay pieces on a smaller bed printer. There are a bunch of printers out there that are about 180 millimeters to 220 millimeters wide. Because of that popularity of that size of printer, anything that's larger than that will typically have a version that will print on that smaller print size. Number three I want to talk about is the stats of 3D printers. Now as somebody that would go out to buy a car and look at stats and horsepower and things like that, I thought I could do the same with 3D printers. The reality is, from, in my opinion, a lot of the stats on 3D printers are just useless. Here's why. Say you look at a 3D printer and it says the max print speed is 150 millimeters per second. If you knew what that meant, that's great, but that doesn't tell you the quality of the print at that speed. The thing you really want to know is can a printer print at this quality and the size and the speed that you want? Printing really fast at a terrible quality is just going to burn up a bunch of filament, cost you a bunch of money, 
and going back to the first point costs you a bunch of time every time you have a bad print it's a whole bunch of time to basically reset up the printer again sometimes bad prints can actually damage your printer I find that the best way to really buy a 3D printer nowadays is to look at reviews. Now the good news is there's tons of blogs and tons of bloggers and, and people on YouTube that are doing amazing reviews of these printers. They're very knowledgeable, they've used quite a few printers and they can really give you a compare and contrast of where those printers are at the current time. So in short, look at the reviews, not the stats. The main exception to this is bed size. C point number two, a bigger bed size is gonna be more efficient. The fourth thing I wanna talk about is software. And there's two aspects of software that I'd like to discuss. One is 3D design software, and the other is what's called a slicer. On the 3D design software aspect, when I was first getting the 3D printing, I was intimidated by the concept of making my own 3D prints. The reality is there is free software out there today that you can learn in about 15 or 20 minutes an example being Tinkercad, and I'll link to more down in the comment section. This free software can be quite powerful and help you create your own 3D prints in a very short time. If you'd like to go to more advanced software, there's things like Blender. And then, if, of course, if you want to go to paid software, there's quite a few that are actually specialized around the 3D printing hobby nowadays. The other software I want to talk about is what's called a slicer. When you print something for a 3D printer, you start out with a 3D model, and the 3D model gets what's called sliced into layers, and then those layers go, get turned into what's called G-code. When you're looking at a 3D printer, you want to make sure that it's compatible with most slicers or any G-code. A lot of printers will just have an SD card on, slot on them, and what will happen is you'll use whatever slicer software you want to print out the G-code, and then you'll put that onto an, a micro SD card place that in the printer and begin your print. The cool thing about that is your printer doesn't have to be wired to your computer. The other cool thing about that is different slicers have different efficiencies and different technologies. They get better over time. So as the slicers get better, you can print more efficiently or better prints. Number five is the placement of the 3D printer. I was under the impression when I was buying a 3D printer that it was going to be a USB cord that plugged into my computer. The reality is many 3D printers simply have that micro SD card that I just talked about. And the slicer software does run on your computer, but then you can either send the print over Wi-Fi or you save it to the SD card and plug it into your printer. Now, knowing if the printer requires a USB cable, Wi-Fi, or, US, or an SD card is important on picking out your printer because it determines where you're going to place it. Now, here's why printer placement is important. There have been recent studies that show that printing uh, almost any filament nowadays, PLA or anything, creates microparticles that can be hazardous to your health. Also, some of the filaments are just straight up harmful. For instance, there is a filament, and a, by the way, a filament's like the ink of the printer. There's a filament that's called ABS that is noxious. You don't want to be breathing these vapors. If you think about what an FDM style 3D printer is, which is the ones that lay down layers of melted plastic, it is melting plastic and you don't want to breathe that in. I highly recommend placing a printer in an enclosure with a carbon filter or having it vent in some way. One of my ideas was to place my printer in my garage and this is another thing I didn't understand about 3D printing. 3D printing is very temperature sensitive. You want to place a printer in a temperature stable room. If you were to place it in a garage at night where it would get cold um, or also the humidity would affect it, it can actually warp and bend your print. There's a lot of prints that really need a stable temperature to come out well based on the filament types. So be aware of where you're going to put your 3D printer when you purchase it, but know that you may not necessarily have to keep it right next to your computer. The next thing I want to talk about is filaments and heated beds. When I was first getting my printer, I asked why was it such a low price and somebody told me, well, it doesn't have a heated bed. My next question was, well, what does that mean? They said, well, you can't print ABS. I didn't know what that meant, and I tried to not sound dumb, so in the forum I asked, well, what can it print? And they're like, well, it prints PLA. At this point, I had been given a whole bunch of acronyms, and I felt pretty stupid. Here's what these things mean. ABS, PLA, TPU, PETG, all of these acronyms are different types of filaments. These are plastics that get placed into the printer, 
they get melted and they create the layers. Now each of them has different properties. For instance, TPU is very flexible. ABS can harden very and become very strong. Some of the filaments require what's called a heated bed. The nozzle or extruder that melts the filament places it down onto a flat surface that's called the bed. If the bed's heated, then it doesn't cool as fast and this will allow it to stick better and prevent warping. This is incredibly important for things like ABS. For things like PETG or PLA, you don't need a heated bed. So knowing what kind of filaments you want to print on and knowing what kind of bed the printer has is an important matchup. For me, I've been printing everything on PLA and the filament science and technology has advanced quite quickly. I would argue the filaments are advancing faster than the print technologies. There are actually filaments out there now that have the features of ABS, such as PETG, where it's very strong, but also have features of PLA where you don't require a heated bed. This gives you a great flexibility and a very strong print. Now, of course, there's downsides such as it might be tougher to paint a PETG print. The other cool thing about filaments is that as they create new filaments, you get new features for your printer and new things you can print that you didn't even know that existed. Examples are glow-in-the-dark filaments or filaments that change color with different temperatures. There's filaments that have wood infused in them or metal. The wood ones can actually be stained or sanded and the metal ones can actually be polished. You can create little prints that look like little bronze statues and there's even marble looking filaments out there. So the filaments out there can take up an entire video on their, on their own, but they're quite exciting and I advise you to look at them and understand which ones you would want to print with and then make sure that those are compatible with the printer that you're looking to choose. Number seven is finishing a 3D print. I call this post-processing. This is everything you do with a 3D print after you pull it off the print bed. On ABS prints, you can use what's called an acetone bath to help smooth it at the expense of some of your detail. On PLA prints, you can use what's called an uh, epoxy like XTC 3D to smooth the print out. Smoothing the print out allows you to do things like paint it and not have the ridges of, uh, viewable. You can also sand a lot of 3D prints and make them smooth out that way. If you do a wood 3D print, you can also stain it um, or sand it as well. So there's a lot of different finishing techniques. I would advise understanding some of these and think about what you want to do after you print an item. If you're going to print out miniatures and paint them, for instance, you might want to order some sandpaper with your 3D printer or make sure you have some on hand. Number eight, talking about things that you want to get with your 3D printer are tools. There's a couple of tools that may not come with your 3D printer. For instance, a putty knife. Putty knives are super useful at getting the print off of the 3D print bed. The 3D print bed is sticky. Basically, you've got melted plastic that gets attached to it, and you want it to stick to make sure that the print doesn't get ruined. So having a nice, sharp, thin putty knife is a great tool to help get that off. Another tool is what's called a digital caliper. A digital caliper will help measure things down to a hundredth of a millimeter. The reason that you want to get down super accurate for your 3D prints is say that you're going to design something such as a phone case. You wouldn't want it to cover up the camera or any of the buttons when you do your design. So having that tolerance of down to a tenth of a millimeter or a hundredth of a millimeter will help your 3D print design be a lot more successful. Number nine is I didn't realize all of the things that you could 3D print. And what I mean by this is all of the categories of things. I went to the explore menu on Thingiverse and went down to collections and just the collections alone gave me tons of ideas of things that I would have never guessed. Things I didn't even know existed. There are entire sections on things like Ikea hacks. There are things for phone accessories. Any video game console, if you want controller holders, accessories, um, all sorts of mods for them. There's stuff for organizing anything, screws, USB sticks. There are things for holding up headphones. Um, I use them on my CNC machine. There are even CNC machines that you can 3D print. This is what led me to my mostly printed CNC project, which you can see in my other videos. Number 10 is that 3D printers can print things to make themselves better. And 
that's just kind of a mind-blowing concept, but it's super useful. And a good example of that is one of the bugs my 3D printer had when I first started out, this is a Cetus 3D, is the head would fall if you turned off power. One of the first things that came out was somebody printed a thing to keep the head from falling when you turned off power. There are things like filament holders, um, there are mods for the fans to make the fans quieter. There are quite a few things that you can print for your 3D printer to improve its performance. I would advise if you're looking at a 3D printer to actually search for that model on Thingiverse and take a look at the mods that you can print for it. It might be an interesting experiment just to see how big the community and how active they are and what they're doing for that 3D printer. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please leave a like. And if you want to see more videos like it, please hit that subscribe button. If you have things that you'd like to see in the next video, please feel free to comment. And if you actually are in 3D printing already, please leave things that you wish you knew in the comments so that we can help the community grow. Thanks for watching. I'm Joe Farrow with Geek Toolkit. I'll see you next time.